So thank you for joining us today. We are going to, it's our 2023 Living Earth Festival. It's the first time that we have been back in the museum live for almost four years. And I'd like to start by gratefully acknowledging the native peoples on whose ancestral lands we gather. My name is Hayes Levis. I work in the community and public programs at the Smithsonian. And as part of our Living Earth celebrations, we are joined by several community leaders to talk about conservation, water, and agricultural challenges they are facing. Our panelists include Amelia Flores, chairwoman of the Colorado River Indian Tribes, Kevin Smallwin, Takta uh, Aquaponics, and Nicole Her uh, Norris, Coast Salish. So, Chairman Flores, would you mind introducing yourself and telling us a bit about yourself and your project? Sorry. It's on. Can you hear me? Okay. We'll do this one more time. Kamadu and Yepi Mul, Amelia Flores, Makav Chadom, Iman Bench, Hipasi Mul, Anya Bukudik, Matevil Hichuk. Greetings, everybody. My name is Amelia Flores. I'm Mojave, and um, my clan is Hipa, which is uh, the Fox clan. Um, I'm honored to be here yes, on this stage and with my uh, cohorts here uh, and as a guest here on traditional lands, ancestral lands. And uh, as um, was mentioned, my, uh, I am the chairwoman of the Colorado River Indian Tribes, and that is located in the state of Arizona. Who's, who's out there from Arizona? Yay. <laughs> Uh, but we are on the, uh, our reservation is on the western side of the state of uh, Arizona. And then um, uh, part of our lands go into California. Um, so I am in my um, second year of my first year term as chairwoman. Um, again, I'm honored to be here and to share on behalf of my tribe, the Colorado River Indian tribes. Thank you. And would you like to talk a little bit about the work that you're doing with the water and the rivers? Okay. Um, as you know, or don't know, the Colorado River runs through our reservation. Um, it has, it's our namesake of Colorado River, Colorado River Indian tribes. Uh, my people have lived uh, along the banks of the Colorado River from time immemorial. And... Um, uh, we are right now dealing with uh, water issues, as you know, the drought in the Southwest, and as the climate change uh, all over the world, we're facing different uh, weather and pa weather patterns. Uh, you know, like it was hot, 90 degrees here in Washington D.C. for the last couple of days, and now it's a cool 70 degrees in the 70s. So I think um, some of the local people have said that th this is very unusual. But anyway, going back to uh, my tribe, uh, the Colorado River Indian tribes, um, we are um, we receive our water from the Colorado River. Um, for uh, irrigating our, our crops. We are farmers. We're agriculture uh, tribe. Uh, let me mention, uh, go back and mention that the, um, the makeup of the four tribes, we have the uh, Mojave, which is indigenous to the area. We have the Chemwevi, Southern Paiute Band of Shoshone Indians. And we have the Navajo and the Hopi that live on our reservation. That's why we're the Colorado River Indian tribes. Uh, I gave my PowerPoint history about our tribes uh, uh, yesterday, um, but through the colonization of the, uh, of the BIA um, and um, their reasoning that there were not enough Mojaves and Chemuevis living on the reservation, they wanted to populate our reservation. Therefore, they brought the, the Navajo uh, and Hopi colonists. Uh, some of the family stayed and some, some uh, haven't. Um, I can say that uh, our tribal members now have all four tribes in them. My grandchildren are called uh, call critters because they have the four tribes. And, and, but anyway, so we are, um, uh, like I said, agricultural people. Um, and as you know and hear on the news quite a bit, 
that uh, the Colorado River uh, is is not up to its levels, um, uh, not enough snowpacks to supply, give the river the supply it, uh, it, it uh, has been in the past. We have the two dams um, uh, along the river, which is the um, uh, um, Hoover Dam, and then uh, we have the um, Lake Mead, uh, not Lake Mead, but um, Page Dam, which I think, is, I don't know if that's what it's called, but that's really north of us uh, from our reservation. But with the dams and, and we have what millions of people who live and use the Colorado River water. We have too many users right now, and so it's depleting, depleting the lakes. And uh, of course, with the not enough runoff, then we're not getting the supplies every spring. So uh, that's basically what we're, we're facing and, and uh, what the tribes started to do, our tribal council, which are nine members uh, of our tribal council, because of the Intercourse Act um, and in our um, uh, decree of our water, we could not lease our water. Um, all the water um, that was allocated to us, we had to use it on our, our, our reservation. Most other tribes in their water sell settlements, in their decrees, they were, they were able to lease their water. So um, we started maybe 20 years ago um, to get a bill, legislation bill put together and get passed. And um, when I got on council, we started working on it again. And um, over the five, seven years, we got it passed through the different committees and um, we finally had it passed in December, uh, approved by Congress, and then uh, Biden signed it, the um, uh, Crit Resiliency uh, Water Act, um, 13, uh, don't quote me on that, or 3308, I believe is our, our bill, but I might be wrong. Um, uh, but it was passed and signed by uh, President Biden in uh, January. I think that's enough. Yeah, thank you very much. So, Caben, you're next. Tell us a bit about yourself and the projects you're working on. Sure. So, my name is Caben Smallwood. I am the co-founder and CEO of a company by the name of Symbiotic LLC. Symbiotic LLC specializes in building recirculating water systems where we raise both fish and produce. I'm from the Choctaw Reservation in southeast Oklahoma. My family arrived in Oklahoma at the end of the Trail of Tears, the walk that was from Mississippi to Oklahoma in about 1830. Uh, once there, we, as a people, uh, were used to being an agricultural-based tribe. And when moved from Mississippi to Oklahoma, uh, a lot of struggle prevailed and a lot of the old ways of farming and traditional knowledge was lost. My brother and I were very fortunate to have learned from our grandfather how to tend to the earth. And through that process, we began to wonder if there was a better way. Uh, that was the impetus behind the start of the company. So our goal is to minimize the use of natural resources while maximizing output from our aquaponic systems, as they're referred to. The systems that we built strategically allow for growing both fish and produce. And due to the fact that we recirculate the water from the system, we are doing our best to trend towards zero nutrient and zero water waste systems as a means of conserving our precious natural resources for our future generations and as a means of feeding our people. Thank you. Okay. And Nicole, could you please introduce yourself and tell us about the, what you're doing up in Canada? First, first I'm sorry, I Pacific know. Northwest. <laughs> My uh, traditional name is Alagami, means she who wears deerskin in house. 
My English name is Nicole Norris. I am a member of the Chalelt First Nation, located in the heart of the Halkaminam Territory. I'm a founding member of the Halkaminam Lands and Resource Society, where I'm a knowledge holder and aquaculture technician. Uh, currently, I'm very deeply engaged in the Sea Gardens Project in the Gulf Islands National Park Reserve in partnership with Parks Canada. We are several years into the project and currently we are restoring the rock walls that um, create the Sea Gardens. And um, we are getting ready to start doing some seeding to increase the biomass and biodiversity in those spaces for food security for the nations of which the shared territory uh, belongs to. Thank you. Actually, Nicole, I'm going to ask you one question to start with. So what are some of the food sources that are actually being grown in the sea gardens? Ah, so um, <laughs> we have a tremendous amount of bivalves. Um, so we've got some manila clams, some little necks, some cockles, some butter clams. Once we create the rock wall itself, it creates a bit of a metropolitan city for other sea life that comes close. So then we have barnacles, which is a, an indication of a very healthy space. It uh, provides an opportunity for mussel, uh, octopus, crabs, fish. It is a, becomes a generated food source for our aquatic loved ones. Um, and of course, our relatives from the forest and from the sky. So it becomes a, like a grocery store, basically. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, so our first question is going to go to the chairwoman. What are some of the difficulties you faced, and what is the most important things you want people who are not familiar with your areas to know? Thank you, Hayes. Can you all hear me? Yeah, okay. I think I have it turned on this time. Um, I think uh, the difficulties uh, we face at the Colorado River Indian tribes, there are a multitude, but foremost is the drought that we are facing um, in the southwest. Uh, the drought has brought on a drier, more drier uh, climate for us. Um, we do, as I said before, we are farmers, so it impacts our, um, our agriculture. But I want to go back to the water. Um, our reservation was uh, established by an executive order, not a treaty. Our lands in the past have been taken away. Our boundaries have been altered. We did receive uh, uh, some lands back in 2005 on the lower end of the reservation. So that was good, but it was our, our um, tribal leaders at that time that worked to get the lands back and restored on back onto the reservation. Um, so with that, with our water decree and our water allocations, the Colorado River Indian Tribes holds the highest priority and the most diversion, where um, we receive over 700,000 700, acre feet of water um, for our lands. And that includes the, the partial in California. So we want to protect that. We want to protect our natural resources because we need that water. And also, we're tied as Mojave people and even the Hopi and Navajo, uh, uh, all tribes, all tribes are connected to water. And um, that's our identity. The river is our identity. We do uh, cultural uh, and uh, 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 religious uh, ceremonies that are tied in with the river. Um, so our creator, Matevil, uh, gave us this water as a resource and also the lands. So as stewards, we've got to protect what our, our resources are, our natural resources. And so that's important. That's, that's an important piece, and that's and information and that doesn't get out because right now all the water users of the, uh, of the Colorado River, you know, they use it as an economic benefit. The cities and towns 
um, you know, they use the water and sell the water. So it's an economic benefit to them. And it is to us also, all of the uh, 10 tribes, upper basin and lower basin, that um, depend on this water. Uh, so that's, that's, I wanted to address that and, and, and share that with you all, that, you know, we're tied into the land. We're tied into the water. We're, ti we're tied into the en environment. And if this river, the Colorado River, goes dry, we can't pick up all of our tribal members and move to another place where there's water. Uh, Non-indigenous people can do that. Well, there's, you know, there's nothing to live off here. We'll go move someplace else. We can't do that as a tribe. So we're resilient. And I believe that, as my ancestors did, they stayed in that area and they were able to thrive off of the land. And so we will continue to do that. But we, you know, we live in an age where we, we have solutions. So uh, one of our solutions uh, is the passing of our legislation, 3308. That's what it is, 3308, where we can help our state of Arizona with our consumptive use of water that is only used on our lands. We can fallow our lands and be able to uh, lease our, 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 our water, not sell it, but lease it. And so um, that's what we're faced with right now and our, our, uh, uh, the issue that is at hand for the Colorado River Indian tribes. And we're working on it. It's an it's, it's a issue that's not going to go away. It's not, it's not going to go away. And um, uh, I remember the name of the dam, and that's Glen Canyon Dam. Sorry. <laughs> I wanted to say that. But, um, yeah, so we, we, you know, we as tribal leaders need to step up to the plate and continue to uh, keep our sovereignty. And with the passing of, of our legislation and the leasing of the water, fortified and supported our sovereignty uh, so that we can provide for our people. Thank you, Haas. Thank you. Um, Kaben, we'll have you next. Which each of our, your communities have dealt with pushback from bureaucratic agencies to recognize and understand the importance of protecting your spaces. What sort of personal challenges have you faced with it? Um, yes, yeah, so in the state where I reside, uh, in Oklahoma, one of the largest industries is the oil and gas industry. Uh, Oklahoma is actually one of the original homes to fracking, which is a term that's used for essentially fracturing and breaking up the earth in order to make oil and gas more accessible. So rather than having to drill multiple wells, an uh, oil and gas company is able to drill one well and then directionally frack or break up that rock, which allows them to access more of the oil and gas off of that initial fixed investment. So one thing that we've seen is that the oil and gas industry has participated in what I refer to as regulatory capture. And it's some of the things that the chairwoman was just talking about that she was able to successfully do as well. And essentially regulatory capture is when one industry or one group of people is capable of shaping the policies and guiding decision making for an institution or a state. So what we found is that in the oil and gas industry, the water resources that get utilized are essentially turned into the most poison water that we have ever created as humans. Then that water is then pumped back into the earth through something known as injection wells and prior to injection wells, the state of Oklahoma had zero recorded earthquakes. And after injection wells, <coughs> Oklahoma is one of the most seismic areas 
at this point in time. What that fracking has also done is it's polluted our water tables and made it to where municipalities as well as individuals living on the reservation do not have access to clean water. And I've seen this myself within the past 10 years. In living in Tallahena, Oklahoma, I remember the first letter that I got in the mail. That letter said, please wait a week before consuming water as we found instances of heavy metals in the water. Then we received another letter and that letter said, if you're elderly or if you were immunocompromised, do not consume the water. And then we received another letter that said, if you are elderly, immunocompromised, or pregnant, do not consume the water. And then we received a final letter that said, do not consume the water. So when we're looking at our resources and the nature of those resources, now that water is no longer potable, we have to look for new ways to guide our agriculture as agriculture is the single biggest user of water. So my goal through our company is to minimize our use of fresh water resources by recycling the water through the system. And our hope is, as we show the regulators, that there are other ways that can be possibilities to make our state profitable that there are other ways to grow food in a more sustainable manner that hopefully we will have the, the same success as the chairwoman. So our battle has just begun, but hopefully we will be around to continue to fight. Thank you. And uh, Kevin, when we were talking earlier, you had mentioned that, you know, not just conserving water was important, that but the process the water had to go through to get it back to us being drinkable? Yeah, so the idea of being able to go to the tap, turn on the tap, and have fresh water is something that a lot of Americans take for granted. What is not understood are the processes that are required in order for that fresh water to get to our tap. So when fresh water literally goes down the drain. It's not just that water that we don't have access to. It's the entire process that that water has to go through in order to find its way back to our taps. And what that's referring to is the water energy nexus. So we're not only wasting water, and I say we as individual consumers, but we're also wasting all the time, effort, energy, depreciation of equipment and resources that it takes to transport that water back to our tap. So please, I do urge you to, to keep that in mind uh, as you move forward that it's not just about the water, it's about all of the resources that it takes to get that water to us. So please be cognizant of that as well. Thank you, Kevin. And then uh, Nicole, can there or are there plans in place that to protect the sites in case of a natural or man-made disaster like an earthquake, oil pipelines, other environmental issues? Thank you. Um, so specifically uh, looking at the Gulf Islands in British Columbia where our aquaculture sites are. Um, some of the gravest uh, concerns for us environmentally are uh, water traffic. So uh, one of our longest sea gardens um, is right in line where there's uh, ferry traffic, uh, big BC ferries. The amount of uh, wake that comes, the contaminants that come off of these ships and the potential of uh, a breakdown of these uh, ships and leaking of certain things into the water is of grave concern. But looking at it more from a climate change perspective, 
Um, we've recently suffered a tremendous amount of flooding during atmospheric river event of 2021. Um, and also we have also suffered a very serious heat dome event. And we've done a tremendous amount of um, investigation around the health of the bivalves in the spaces that we're trying to revive. Um, so there's a lot of layering factors when we're talking about flood. So we have some upland owners, uh, septic leaks, um, washing over the land and coming on to the uh, beach itself, which is presenting with more contaminants. Um, when we look at it from a heat dome perspective, we have a risk of losing um, bivalves to the, the heat itself. With the areas where the wall is, um, we've discovered though that uh, the beach is able to stay much cooler. The other concern, of course, would be fire. The Gulf Islands are uh, ordained with a tremendous amount of uh, forest and so if the trees were to burn and then we were to have some sort of a water event take place there's a tremendous amount of carcinogens uh, that would then go out onto the beach. The other thing uh, that is of the paramount concern at the moment um, that is not weather related unfortunately it is uh, human related it is microplastics. We recently um, had some interaction with the beach to go and look for um, urchin plankton. And when the sample was brought back and uh, looked at under a microscope, what we thought was a tremendous amount of urchin plankton turned out to be microplastics. The sea gardens that we have been restoring for a decade or more, the effort of trying to bring back a resource that contributes a large amount of our traditional diet, the same ingredient that my ancestors ate, um, that I'm hoping to be able to cultivate so that my great-grandchildren will be able to sit in those spaces and say, my great-grandmother helped to restore this, is now plagued by microplastics. One of the things that I talk about most is water quality. Water is paramount to the things that we're trying to do on the beach. And if our bivalves, if our relatives from the sea don't have clean water to drink, then our relatives of the forest that also dine on that, uh, on that aqua life will also be unwell. And our relatives of the, of the sky, we have a tremendous amount of birds that feed off the beach. They too will become unwell. And so you know, I talk a lot about how it's not just about us, it's about our relatives of the sea and the forest and also the generations that are yet to come. And um, with a focus on water, uh, one of my gravest concerns is, is that water quality piece and how it relates to our communities. Um, and listening to my colleague share about the announcements to his community, um, that, is, that is my absolute gravest fear, is that we will become one of the many nations, not only across Canada, but across the United States that does not have potable drinking water, let alone the traditional access to the traditional diet um, from ancestor to future generation. Thank you, Nicole. So, and then I'm going to give them one final question, and then we'll open it up. So, in recent years, there have been a lot of conversations about what we can do to save our planet. What advice would you give people who want to help? As a call to action, what is something that people could do? Chairman? Chairwoman, pardon me. I 
I think we, we have to take a look, take a look at our environment, take a look at who we are as indigenous people and non-indigenous people on, on this planet that we live on and be conscious of our natural resources. You can go down to the store, you know, and pick up what you need and um, it's ready, readily available. Um, use it for however you, you need it and then, you know, dispose of your, your, your waste, your, your, your trash. Um, and, and to get involved, to get in involved with your local community, your local uh, um, governing, for us it's the tribal council, uh, committees and boards, get active in committees and boards. Um, I don't know who all is a, a serves on a committee, uh, a, community, uh, a board or a, uh, a committee right now. But you can step up to the plate and you can make a change in where we're going with our, our, our uh, climate, our climate change. I um, remember uh, being uh, as the librarian archivist for our tribe, a young lady came up because I sit on the school board back home. I sit on our school, <coughs> school district um, uh, as a board member. Uh, she was having some difficulties with um, <coughs> her grades and teachers and, and uh, you know how teenagers are. Sorry if there's any teenagers in this audience, but, uh, you know, we did a lot of, uh, 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 so I gave her advice. And so she said that her decision was she was going to go to a boarding school. I'm, you know, done with public schools and I'm going to go to boarding school. And I says, well, you do that. Whatever, you, whatever you choose, it's your choice. And, and, you know, that's what you want to do. But what I would like to see you do is once you get your, de your degree, your high school, you know, diploma, degree, then you run for state legislature, le legislator. You run for a seat on our, uh, uh, for our, our uh, law with, along with our lawmakers. If you want to see a change, it's going to take years, but you can be that person to do that, is, is to run for an office run for a local office. Um, so that would be my, ad, my advice, and I, I use that um, from my past experience and, and encouraging, and uh, especially with the young folk, our youth, to be, to be a role model, to be a role model. But w with the climate change, you know, there's a lot of factors in, in, in the climate change in, uh, in our environment. I just went to uh, the UN uh, last month as a, uh, a panelist on a side um, uh, uh, in, in the UN, but it was a side, it wasn't uh, part of the UN. So we were able to speak re regarding uh, our, our issues with our reservations and, and indigenous people. But I met so many people from around the world, so many people there uh, who had issues not even having water, water um, uh, to their small community or to their village, and the, the issues they, they face. And it goes deeper in some communities and some indigenous people. The water, the lake, the rivers, the streams hold cultural values. It's not only a place where you know, they can gather and, and have their water and, and take their water home, but it has a deeper meaning. And I don't, you know, we've lost that. We've, we, we've lost that, I, you know, that, that value in us as, uh, as Americans, the value of what we have to be able to put a cup under the faucet and then take a drink. It just has become norm. Um, so um, get involved. If you're thinking about 
in the next two years. Uh, I believe that's uh, election uh, election time, whether it's next year in your tri in your small community. But that's my advice that I would have uh, to start changing uh, uh, the world and, and making uh, a difference. Is that you all can make a difference, no matter if you're just a housewife or retired. You still can make a difference. Um, I, I don't. Um, water is life. Water is life, and I hope that I answered um, because it, I'm speaking to the audience and, and speaking to everybody here where you're at at this time and in this place. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman. Ms. Kevin, you're next. Sure, so echoing some of those same sentiments, I was once told when you point a finger, you have three pointing back at you. So the number one thing that I would suggest would be to go and look in front of a mirror and address your own water usage, whether that's brushing your teeth, whether that's washing your dishes, whether that's limiting the amount of time that you shower, whether that's hanging clothes outside to dry with the sun, whether that's being cognizant of running your sprinklers, whether that's being cognizant of your own water waste. Additionally, uh, my background is economics, so I will tell you that in your place, in their place, in my place, and in your place, you all have a vote, and that vote is with your dollar. If you choose to support companies, tribes, organizations, that do things the right way, what you will enable those organizations to do is to scale their operations. And when we allow people who do things correctly to scale their operations by voting with our dollars, those entities become more competitive. Those entities have more resources to further the goals and objectives that will benefit us all. So whether it's charitable giving, whether it's looking at how your food is produced, how your food is grown, and not shopping strictly based upon what something costs, because that cost is a monetary cost. But oftentimes, society bears the negative implication of those cost savings. So just because something is cheaper doesn't make it better. And just because something is more expensive doesn't make it worse. But at the end of the day, we all choose how to allocate our limited resources. So I encourage you to do just that. Thank you, Kevin. And Nicole, what do you think? Um, so one of the things that I uh, teach about most is about our participation in con consumerism. To be a lead in the recycling spaces, recycling clothes, recycling plastic, uh, in Canada, more specifically where I live, we have a ban on single-use plastic. Uh, I went to the CVS the other day, and the lady asked me if I wanted a bag, and I was prepared to pay the dollar, two dollars for a cloth bag, and she gave me two plastic bags together. And I said, wow, I haven't seen a plastic bag in a long time. We've gone back to paper and we've gone to, to cloth bags. They're eliminating the straw. They're getting ready to eliminate the single-use coffee cup from Tim Hortons and Starbucks. Moving back into 
uh, continued use containers, water bottles, those travel coffee cups. If you need clothing, go through your closet and go to your local thrift store. You'd be amazed the treasures you find there. Be mindful of the amount of water that you are using. That is the that is the biggest thing. I always I used to tease my children if they ran the tap and I said, you know what? Somebody's so, a dolphin is probably flopping around on a shore somewhere because you've wasted all this water. Turn it off. I mean, I think about very deeply around containered water. Um, I did some study into some of the uh, bottled water companies. And it's true, I became, I became a label reader and, and digging deeper into some of these companies and how they treat the people from the spaces in which they derive things from. And about supporting the companies that do things in a more environmentally responsible way, honoring those human rights of the people that are supporting them, bringing the focus down towards our communities, our reserves. In the beginning, we traveled extensively. We visited with one another, sharing stories, language, resources. And now, because of the communities that are beside us, and the lack of personal responsibility around their consumerism, we are further being encroached upon. And I don't think it's fair. I think that we as individuals have got an environmental responsibility about the way that we live and walk on this, on this land. It's not about us. It's about the people that are yet to come. Hi, Thank you. Well, that concludes the conversation up here. If you all have any questions, there's a microphone with Jay. Jay, hold up your hand. And Jay will be, you can ask a question. Uh, please use the microphone. And if you have a particular person you want to ask, direct the question to them. Thank you. No questions? Oh, could you go to the microphone, please? beginning of this you guys were talking about um, uh, like boat usage of waterways and how much of an impact it made uh, specifically I believe you were talking about dams at that point could you be more thorough or give a more thorough ex explanation of exactly the impact of all that and I'm assuming you're talking about motorboat usage correct not like um, uh, like um, not octane boats like recreational boats so let me um, clarify the question. You're asking about the impact of motorboats on the yeah. waterways, particularly with the dams. Is that, am I understanding that right? Yes. Uh, okay. If I understood what was said earlier, I may be off on my understanding, but just trying to get some clarification. Well, if, if there's no runoff and there are overuse of our rivers, and particularly the Colorado River, then their boats won't, won't be able to speed on, <laughs> on the waters. But I did, not, um, I did not mention boats. It's just the uh, overuse of the Colorado River. Um, we have so many uh, uh, users, uh, mi municipalities, uh, individuals, uh, cities, towns, uh, that, that, uh, that use the, the Colorado River and there's not enough runoff. So that's what I was talking about. Um, uh, so okay, sorry, Thank you. No, no boats. Okay. So, so. <laughs> but come on the river and, and uh, boat while you can. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to it before deferring to my colleague about the boat situation. I know she has some anecdotal information. But the, the point of a dam is to restrict the flow of water. And as we thought dams were going to be a useful tool for conservation, 
or for deriving energy, what we inevitably did was we changed the way that water moved naturally through our ecosystems by diverting it and containing it in areas that it's not meant to contain. What this did was it had a negative effect downstream uh, on the people that relied on that water and also on the, the animals and wildlife that relied on our water. So while the concept was good in theory, in practice the ecological damage that was done, uh, some could argue outweighed the benefit of the dams. Additionally, what good is a dam if there's no water to hold? which is a situation that we're getting into right now. So tons of resources, whether it's manpower, concrete, engineering, uh, carving out areas of the earth with power tools that weren't meant to be carved out. Those things in the long term have had a negative effect. And I think that as we begin to allow water to flow in the way that it was meant to flow, or allow our keystone species, such as beavers, to help determine where dams need to be, as opposed to, to man. So, in my opinion, uh, the dams, while they have served a short-term purpose, in the long-term, the economic benefit will be negative. Thank you for that. Um, so I was the one that was chatting a little bit about boats. Um, and so my gravest concern around uh, our shellfish beaches is because this is a food source that we are trying to rejuvenate. And we are uh, arm wrestling with uh, sport boats. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of um, sailboats that come into our waters. In the summertime, uh, Americans show up in our water and they park. And sometimes the tide is pretty great and they move. So we've got um, anchors that are then being dragged along the seafloor. Not only that, but we also have a grave concern around tankers. They recently updated one of the tanker ports in the mainland, and the tanker traffic has increased tremendously. I recognize that uh, it's a bit of a catch-22 at times. I can complain all I want about the anchors and the bilge dump and the contamination to our waters, but the containers that sit on those tankers is toilet paper and rice clothing, things that we need to live day to day, car parts, oil for oil change on our vehicles, tires, uh, supplies for schools, medical equipment. So my biggest concern is around tankers parking in open waters where there is a lack of um, identified jurisdiction and then trolling. I would prefer if they paid possibly a fee to be in those spaces in order to put back uh, dollars towards habitat restoration because there's so much that's affected um, simply just by the tankers alone. Thank you. Petra. All right. I think we have time for one more question. presenting very innovative solutions and addressing the severity and crisis that you're facing. Uh, for Amelia Flores, I'd like to ask uh, what, can, first of all, congratulations on the passage of the Act uh, 3308. Could you please just um, expand on how that will be helping your uh, communities. How it would? How, 
Yeah, so the, qu the question you're asking is how is the passage of the bill going to be um, uh, affecting their community positively? Is that the question? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Good question. Um, the passing of uh, our, our Resiliency Act 3308 uh, was a history in the making. I think we, we are the fir uh, first tribe to get uh, such a bill passed by Congress and signed by the president uh, for our water and to lease our water. Um, I don't know if I said it earlier, but um, in my PowerPoint yesterday presentation, um, in, in settlements and um, decrees, uh, and more recently with tribes, you know, they have that included in their uh, decrement their um, allocation um, uh, settlement that they can lease their water off. Uh, but for the Colorado River Indian tribes that was never uh, a, 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 an option for us uh, so that will uh, help the tribes economically uh, as I said before we are an agricultural uh, uh, people. We farm on our lands. We lease our lands out. We have a crit farm that um, uh, is run by the, the government, and that brings in revenue. So um, we live in a rural area, a uh, very rural uh, area, and we do have a casino, uh, but uh, with most tribes, you know, and, and most community people think that you're making buku bucks at a, at a casino. But um, sometimes, you know, uh, people don't go out and gamble. <laughs> so we, we, you know, we receive uh, uh, fund, funding to run our government through our enterprises uh, with CRIT, the casino and the um, uh, CRIT farms being, being the... Um, the uh, top of uh, the chain to provide our our monies to do services for for to run our government. So uh, by leasing our our, our lands, uh, not leasing our lands, but leasing our water, then that would be uh, income for for the tribe, uh, for the people. The other thing is that uh, our infrastructure, our irrigation project, which uh, is run by the government, BIA. It's not run by the tribes. Uh, it, it, it needs desperate repairs. It need, where you, they're still using wooden gates, so they have to bring that um, that's the standard up the, uh, for the running of this irrigation project. We have leakage, seepage, um, uh, and, and evaporation. Uh, so uh, we will be using um, our money, and we have been using our money in the past for uh, repairs on the, um, uh, the, the canals, lining the canals. Um, we do have a 638 contract uh, from the BIA to assist in, in uh, when the um, dry up, we have a dry up in uh, January. Um, so we're able to make repairs to our canals. So it'll be um, uh, bringing income, income uh, in, into the tribes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, but you had something else you wanted to add? Yeah, one thing that I would like to share, uh, your question and the success of the chairwoman reminded me of a quote that I learned in my federal Indian policy class in law school. And my professor, Dennis Arrow, said that Federal policy towards indigenous people is like a pendulum. And that pendulum swings from annihilation to self-determination. And right now, at this point in time in history, that pendulum is swinging back more towards self-determination. So as a call to action, now is the time now is the time to make those meaningful changes. Now is the time to try to influence policy because what that looks like in 10 years, we may not know. So thank you for being a living example of that. Nicole, thank did you, you want to add much. any? Okay. All right, so that's all we have time for for right now.
So thank you for joining us. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, all three of these people presented yesterday. That'll be online if you want to see stuff more in depth. I recommend you go there. They'll also be out in the Potomac after this session. Thank you for joining us today.